So Patrick, I wanted to get your thoughts on how animation has evolved in the last 20 years to actually having a CGI character in a reality, sh in, a, in, a, in, a, in a TV show. I think a lot of it comes from educational system, weirdly. Like, um, the movie industry and TV and animation is, is pretty, um, it feels pretty magical as a high school kid. You're like, I can, you, can, you feel like you can almost do it. You have a computer, they have a computer. It's like, what's the difference? I could just learn this stuff, right? And it turns out you kind of can. And when I was in college, um, Around, around 99, 2000, only a few schools were teaching this, but it was clearly like a big industry that was happening. Now, um, you can get education online at iAnimate or Animation Mentor, and it's just as good as a college education. And we're, and we're building these, like, like these internet trade schools that um, produce really talented people, or really just increase access to the people that have the talent in the first place. So the pool of talented animators is there now, and it's just a question of how to attract them and get them to do something fun, and, and that's just in um, providing a show like this for them to sink their teeth into, which is not monsters, it's not, uh, it's not horror, it's, it's not what most television animation is, it's not super kiddie, and it has real acting in it with a nice voice to go to, and that's like really juicy for an animator. So knowing that, I was like, I think I can convince enough really great animators that there's some juice here to have fun with and, um, and actually get a show made that's, that's high quality because of the talent pool being so strong right now. And the tools have kind of democratized over the last 20 years where like, it's, you can do it on most laptops now. So um, you know, leveraging all of that technological wave, someone was going to do this. And, um, and I... I I could guide the quality of the animation personally to get to a point where it would be entertaining. That was the kind of end game of it in general. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big cinema fan and back going way back and I remember the first time you saw like a CGI character interact with uh, a real life person was Casper. It was like, one of the first movies that did that and I remember the behind the scenes was so brutal and the shots had to be set up a certain way and, you had to, and what's, what, do you, what do you think of the evolution of, from a production standpoint of what they could do, you know, I think that was back in like the 90s yeah. when you were in college to now where you can actually just put a puppet in it and literally just replace it later. Well, there's a lot of really cool, quick technological tricks that we're doing. Um, one of those is the 3D scanning the environment. So the set gets, it, 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 in like two or three seconds, the VFX soup, Sal could, she could scan 3D the environment and then she could take an HDRI image which captures the lighting from pitch black to sun bright. And that way you don't actually have to create any of that. You know, like back at Casper Day, they had to remake all that stuff. And now we just get an image, it's from a sphere, you just know what the room is like, you can put the character in there and it's lit properly to start. And then you add like pretty lights to make it look a little bit better. The animation side of it, Rachel was always videotaped, so when she was acting, animators would use that as a start, but this is all hand keyframed, it's not motion captured. So um, the nice thing about that is that it's really juicy for animators to do, and I just made sure that there was a, there was a couple really talented people up there at Zoic. Um, you know, we brought in a lot of animators for this and brought in some feature animators to make sure that at least the leadership um, was able to elevate the performance to a level where the audiences are used to. And then we, uh, we cut corners in smart ways, like the first sim, it's not as noticed when the character doesn't move very much. So we didn't simulate the fur unless she's like hanging upside down or doing something where you would really notice that. Right. And uh, it's all time for rendering, yeah, that is so Yeah, it was an extra couple of days yeah. and a couple of days in TV when we're spending six weeks per episode yeah. is very, that's a huge amount of time. So that six weeks has to take blocking, acting, reworking, and all the rendering into consideration. But luckily, that stuff has all sped up so much in the last 10 years that it's finally possible. Now, do you think um, 2D animation still has a viable place in the animation world, or do you think it's getting phased out with 3D animation? Uh, well, currently 2D is king in certain realms. Like, it's in, in television animation for kids, 2D is still way more there than 3D, mainly because, um, 2D allows you to be very uh, sort of caricatured in a way that 3D isn't. 3D looks so real already that caricatured movement doesn't work as well, but in 2D you can kind of do wacky movement or holds that are completely still and it's okay. In CG it dies. So for some reason the American market considers CG like the expensive thing. They're really the same like when it comes down to it. It's not really a cost thing. And in the European market, there's tons of 2D animation being done. It's just not something that American audiences 
see, part of that is just the marketing budgets are so big for these animated studios that that's what you get. Um, but if you go to like Annecy, the festival in France, biggest animation festival in the world, more, more of the features there are hand-drawn than CG, because it's actually a little bit more accessible uh, to smaller crews. It just doesn't make it here. I also want to get your thoughts on uh, the video game industry and how that's evolved, uh, you know, in terms of just playing it. Because before, there was a huge, there was a lot of polygons, a lot of rough edges, a lot of bad textures. Now it's almost like you're watching an animated film while you're playing a game yeah. in real time. It's pretty much the same. Like, animating, animating for video games now and movies is no different. It's just about choice, you know, they're choosing. And um, VR is a interesting, like, it's also kind of shifting things a little bit. I, and I... You know, I made a, a VR thing last year, and, and the idea of like working in VR in 3D is really awesome, and I think it's going to lead to even better work and more real-time solutions for things to get looking good. I, there's not a lot of reason to render right now. You can do most stuff real-time, or pretty close to real-time. It's a spectacular shot with a million models in yeah. frame, yeah. Yeah, so I think creating in VR and creating in real-time engines is where to go because currently in CG, camera and lighting is very separate. Like, they're two ends of the pipeline. And if you have a real-time system set up, you could be a, a virtual cinematographer, essentially, and do those at the same time. And I think we'll get really cool filmmaking out of an animation when that starts to, when the game technology starts to filter into movies a little bit. Do you think we'll, we'll see VR sitcoms in the next three years or so? Probably, maybe. You know, on the camera tag, I guess. I've been working on one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it, but uh, it's a long way off. And I'm like, is it going to be done in three years or not? <laughs> um, no, I think there's. I think from this and from meeting the other producers and knowing that um, you know they have experience in the live action, um, the the multicam sitcom where you go live to see a show. I feel like there's a version of VR where you're seeing a live show motion captured somewhere else but you can watch it in your living room live and clap and interact and talk back and be an audience I think there's something to that that makes the VR experience better than watching a regular show and that's a, I think that's the important thing is that if you want to introduce a new technology it's got to be better it can't just be like a different version of the same thing it has to like totally add something else and the thing that VR has the potential to add is the social aspect of watching things that doesn't exist on uh, TV in the same way. So I think we're, we'll head there and someone's gonna do it awesome, but I'm trying, I have a couple things that we're trying to do, yeah.